Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first talk today here in database area. Um, and welcome to Froscon. Um, my name is Stephanie Stolting. I'm working at Pax Life. And uh, we are doing some crazy kinds of things because we, most of you might have servers in the cloud. We have servers above the clouds. Our servers are flying because we are doing inside entertainment. So, but we are doing it on own devices, which does mean we have flying Postgres. And that does mean we have flying elephants, which is totally crazy sometimes, but it's a lot of fun. So that's about me and us. What's about today is Postgres and JSON. So first of all, Postgres is JavaScript object notation. Simple like that. Invented for JavaScript, but now widely used for communications and uh, interactions between applications and all these kind of things. We don't have to care about encoding. That's a complete different thing, for example, compared to XML or worse things, CSVs, because it's defined as Unicode. But most implementations use UTF-8. UTF-8 is a subset of Unicode, but well, good enough. Used for data exchange in web applications, but not only there. It's also used to exchange data between different APIs. It turned out to be also very practical in use there. Currently, we do have two standards. There is this one by Douglas Crockford. And uh, then there is this ECMA. The one by Douglas Crockford is very funny because it's only, when you print it, it's only five pages. That's the whole definition. And the other fun fact is it's really human readable. So I've seen a lot of. RFCs and specs, and when you ever took a look at uh, the standards about SQL, uh, it's always facing a lot of pain to read it because it's not very well human readable and understandable. But that one is really clear in everything it does say about it, and that makes it easy. So in Postgres, we are using the one that is implemented by Douglas Crockford. So that's about that. JSON data types and Postgres are available since version 9.2, welcome, uh, which is some years ago. So we have it for four years now. And then there was an extension, BSON. BSON is, an, is originally done by uh, MongoDB. And there is an extension available on GitHub since 2013, which I played a lot with at the time being, because it was better than the JSON implementation that Postgres had itself. And on the other hand, it was completely um, the same implementation as it was in MongoDB. So I played a lot with, with Meteor at the time being. And uh, I also changed Meteor not to use MongoDB, because I wanted to have it uh, completely asset. And I used this BSON data type in Postgres. Was some hacking, but was in the end it was running, but it was only for my personal fun. Never published that because it was a lot of bugs inside. It was just, would it be possible to do it? So then it came out that uh, JSON B was invented. JSON B is done in 9.4, and uh, it's completely different to the ones that we had before. So it's compressed JSON, which is one of the most important things. When it writes the data away, you don't see any JSON that is saved on disk. It's fully transactional. Does mean you can everything you can do with Postgres asset compliance. Does also work here with JSON. And you can use it for up to one gigabyte per field. So one record, one gigabyte per field, which is for JSON enough usually. So now we go to the JSON functions that are available. So 
This one is very funny because it simply really does what, what it's named to, row to JSON. So you do a usual SQL statement and you return the complete result, each row, as JSON, just with one function. We will see that later on. So then Postgres does have arrays, so which is very, very good that uh, we are able to use arrays and that makes life easier inside the database because we can handle them inside and store them, but we can also export arrays as JSON also with just one function, calling the function, and it does what it is named. JSON B2 record set is uh, the opposite of that one because you can use JSON B to return SQL data and work on it again, like you worked with uh, other things and tables without any problems if you have defined it properly. We have several operators, so an array element is just returned in, in that way, which is okay. You can also, that is the position by the way, and that is uh, the array element by name, so you can also use it by name if you know the name. We have objects inside JSON, you can also get the objects. And you can get a value at a certain path. So just give me in an array this kind of value which I just want to have. Well, there's the other thing that you should do with JSON to make it faster because we can use indexes on JSON B. It does not work with JSON. So indexes are only available for JSON. Um, Nowadays, this JSON type is only used if it's just for storing and not for accessing it mostly later on because uh, it's not that fast and it's not compressed, so it does consume a lot of more resources than JSONB. In Postgres, we have this nice named GIN index, which is a geographical index. And the fun is that we can index a complete JSON-B because JSON is mostly paths and then it does just work here. So we don't have to index values inside a JSON as it, done, as it is done, for example, by Mongo. We just create an overall index and we can access everything through that index, which makes it must, much faster and we don't have to care about certain detailed indexes. But you can even do these crazy things as to create unique indexes on JSON. I don't know if it does make sense. It just is possible. So if you need it, you can do it. Now we come to new JSON functions. With 9.6, there is one new function that is a JSON B insert that inserts a certain value into a JSON B path and returning the complete change JSON. Um, 9.6 is currently in beta 3, so will be out later this year, probably around September, so just before the European Postgres conference in Tallinn this year, I guess. And for the details, you can already see the documentation. Everything is in there with examples, and uh, it's also a nice extension to the functions that we already do have. With 9.4, we got a lot more functions in, in JSONB because we needed some that do help us, for example. JSONB Pretty makes the JSON human readable. So it's not for computers, it's for us that we are able to pass the JSON with our eyes. Makes it easier when you code it. JSONB set is for update or add values inside JSON. Then we have new operators. The concatenate is you can just put together two JSONB fields and you get the result of this, con this concatenation. And there is this delete where you can delete a key, give it a key, and the key will be removed out of uh, the JSONB. 
if somebody still is stuck with 9.4, there is an extension available at PGXN that uh, does implement all these 9.5 versions into 9.4, so they are even usable in a little bit older version. So what I'm using later on is uh, these data sources from Chinook database that is available on the web. And I'm also will be using some Amazon book reviews. They are some years old, but they have been available on the web, so I use them to show some data or examples with that. Speaking about the tables, that is uh, a table in the Chinook database uh, that are available. So we are only using some of them, which will be this one where it is the artist, only has two columns. We use uh, then an album. It's about music, you would have guessed. And we use tracks then. So to see what is possible with uh, relational data to work with that on JSON. Coming about another question. Uh, does everybody know what a CTE is? If not, please raise your hand. OK, so that's worth to talk about it. CTEs are in length common table expressions, and I will use them very often in my examples. Um, it's also known as with queries, because they start, you start a query with a with statement. And uh, the example from Postgres is that you can do in recursive with and with and select all that data and have here an n plus 1 until it's less than 100. So you can select that afterwards. So you select here that t that you've defined up here. And then you get a result. So in, to make it clear, it's another form of subselects. When you do that in a subselect, you would have here inside with brackets and with everything. And these kind of things are much more human readable and makes life really better to understand SQL statements that have some sort of subselects. So let's see how it does work. So what I'm doing here, here you see I start with a with, and here we are already with the common table expressions. So I give it a name that comes directly after the with, then it is the S, and then I define what I want to do. And then it gives me the album ID, the track ID, the name from the table track, and I want to have, to have this data returned as JSON each row. So I just give here this row to JSON, just the table name that I've defined up here. That's it. And the result you see, we have JSON. And it was some sort of not that slow, 30 milliseconds for these is not slow. The advantage is that you can use uh, your current existing tables and mix them up with JSON or return them as JSON and you can do it with inside, inside the database and you have it just available. So the next one then would be that I extend the query and make it a little bit smaller here. So Beamer is not the best one. Um, so I'm going on with these tracks. And then, that is the good thing that you can do with uh, the common table expressions, that is that you can change them. So that does mean here I create these, define these tracks that we've already seen before. And here I define another one, JSON underline tracks. And there it is, I select the, the row to JSON as it has been done in the statement before. And that is based on that one. So and in the next one, I'm going to select some album data. And I select them here inside from the album table. And go down. And I join them with the JSON. 
So I can access every table that I've defined previously in the common table expression. And uh, that makes it very handy to work that way. And it's really better readable as to have it as subselects and, and brackets and all these kind of things. And uh, what I'm doing here is um, I'm using the JSON data that we've already seen from the last, res that's the last result still. And here I'm joining them together with uh, the album so that I can do it. I defined it here that I can access this album ID from that JSON that we have seen. Somewhere here, there's the album ID, there's a, there's a field inside the JSON, and um, I just return that result as an int so that I can use it just in a join. And here I'm joining a table with JSON, group it by somewhat data. And in the end, there comes then the result. Here I'm selecting from what I've defined here as in albums. And I put an array egg on top of it. So that does mean when we have a look, we create an array. We still have the artist ID in front. And here we have lots of data already defined as arrays, where we have not only the artist, we have also the albums. And not only one, we have all albums in one row. So what we can also do is instead of having that done by this way, we can, the way before, we can also use it uh, to create a, a view so that we can better handle the data that is inside uh, this result. So I'm going again here until the albums. There's that join again that we've seen before. And uh, here comes then the next common table expression here, where I'm selecting what we've seen here, the complete array act about the albums, groups them by the artist ID. Now I connect that data with the artist itself, because we had that uh, from there. I have the artist ID right there, so I can join them together very easy that way. And what I'm now doing, I'm returning the complete result as JSON B. Instead of having an array with an artist ID that we've seen before, I create a view that returns the complete result as JSON B. So it created that view. Let's see how it does look like. So here we see a complete, complete data set for JSON data returned by this view that we've created previously. And it's still not that slow. Because it has all artists that are in the database and with all albums and with all tracks. Albums and tracks of one artist are encapsulated in one record or one field. So, now let's see how it does really look like with this JSON B pretty. And I'll make it a little bit bigger so that you see that much better. And you see that JSON B pretty does really do a good job because it really creates pretty JSON in the result with, uh, with line breaks, with indention, so that it's really human readable. So if you create JSON and you are in the development process, use this JSON B pretty because it helps you to understand what data you do return. Uh, without that, what we've seen before, everything in one row, you don't find anything. Um, with that, you are able to find the structure, see the structure, identify the problems, and uh, are able to access the data. So with the next one, we are getting some data from that view. And we are still using JSON methods. 
But what we are doing now, when you have a look, is come on. Now I'm con I have converted JSON data from the view, and I reconvert that JSON data into relational data again by accessing the data fields inside the JSON. So what I'm doing here is I had first tables with structured data, SQL standard, and I switched that into JSON, and now I use that data to uh, return it again as relational data. So it's JSON, it's structural data, JSON, structural data. And it's still not that slow, running on my not that fast computer. So we can also return a little bit more. What we have here is uh, I'm selecting again the, the data that we already had. And I return here array elements. So that I can have the album title again as elements here and get the data out there. So how does it look like is so completely relational again. So here you access the data and it just returns all the data again. Um, because we have here, we have arrays, we have to return them twice so that we have the data outside the array relationated again. So that is the same as we have seen it before with uh, the relational data. With wherever everything is in here with where album titles. You see I get it by name. That's Metallica in this case. So just stumbled upon it. But we can do it also in a different way because there is this function JSONB to record set that returns the data selected here and returns it with the definition that we give here in the S part. Um, here you see a subselect because that is inside the JSONB record set function where you give the query that you want to select from. So here we see I get only the data for the artist ID with uh, the ID 50. And what we see here is we still have here the tracks, which is still JSONB, but it returns the rest of it again as relational data so that we are able to access this right away. Any questions so far? So, making it smaller again so that we can see it. So here I'm selecting some data again from this JSONB record set and uh, to get that data displayed that way. So these are then the album ID, a track ID, is the track name, the media type, whatever it is. And uh, that is the milliseconds, how, it, how long it does, uh, how long it is. And it does have, for whatever reason, a unit price. Um, it's just there, so I have to mention it. When, when I return the data, I have to mention all the fields here that are inside uh, that JSONB field to return them. Otherwise, you might run into a problem. So you have to know what's inside that JSON. What I'm doing now is some sort of crazy thing. I'm creating a function for a trigger because my computer is very low here. So. That's a little bit crazy because what I'm going to do show now is that I can even update the data in the view that we recently created. So we remember that we had this view where we created JSON from relational data. And um, that was a very complex view because it's not straight just connecting some tables. 
but in Postgres you are able to make that view writable. What you have to do is you have to write your own function for that and Postgres supports for this trigger function so I only update then the artist here so what I'm going through is getting the JSON data, comparing if there was any change. If there was a change, then I run an update on the original table. And uh, I keep it here as that because that would go much deeper with uh, updating the albums and the tracks itself. It's also possible for this. You have to use upsert, which is new since 9.5 where you can insert or update uh, data with one statement in Postgres. And uh, it's just that it's only some error handling. So if something goes wrong, that we can display an error. So that trigger was created, but it's not attached as triggers are only created as triggers without a connection to the database, which is at some times very useful because I can reuse my triggers. So what I'm doing here now is um, I use this trigger and let it run instead of an update on that view that we created recently. And uh, so now it's attached. So what I'm able to do now is manipulate data, first only visible things. So what I'm going to do here is I'm selecting some data out of the JSON uh, to show it. And I change some data with the JSON B set command. So what I have to give here is uh, the field where the data is in. And here I'm naming what should be changed. And here I write whatever it is. So I can just change data on the fly and replace text inside the JSON. So that was the original artist name, and that is what I've replaced it with. And, but that's not written in the database. It's only inside the result what, that we see right here now. It's just getting a result where we can change JSON, JSON data on the fly. So, but now, as we know how we could do it, we update that JSON data. And uh, that query updates the view. And with this, just name it new, Metallica, um, had to give it a name. So let's see how it looks like. And you see the JSON has changed. And the JSON comes through the view directly from the table. So. just in case that you don't believe me. That is the access to the table. And I've written through the view from JSON through the table back. So you're even able to change your JSON data that you created on relational data and put it back into the original tables. Uh, that takes some effort, of course, to write all these stored procedures. Um, I've used the uh, standard language that is usually used that is uh, PG, PL, SQL, but you're also able to, to lose a lot of other languages. Uh, Python is available. Uh, JavaScript is available for, for writing stored procedures or functions in, uh, in Postgres. So you have a choice what you do. And recently, we have changed our data with uh, the function that we see up here again, where, where's my, one up. So here I used uh, the data, the JSON B set to replace that inside. But there is, as I said, that we have another one. There is the concatenating op operator. Um, the concatenating operator, you can reuse it for the same as what we have did with the JSON B set, because if there is a change in, in a key value inside, it replaces it, it overrides it. Everything that's new will be uh, extending the JSON, but uh, the 
uh, changes are just overwritten. So uh, that is what we see here. So it's still the same as in the first uh, example where I have the artist ID, the original value of the JSON, I can do whatever I want, and also can give the uh, correct name with uh, the uh, other function. So now we use the concatenation here to write the data back to bring it back to the original name with the other function. So that does work also with the concatenation. So the trigger was executed, hopefully. Let's see how it does look like in the JSON data. So here we see we've done it with the concatenation operator. We've done the same thing as, as we did before with the set operator. Um, as the concatenation operator is much more complex, it takes a little bit longer to manipulate the data. So when it's only changing data, use JSON B set. If you also want to extend data or have changes and extending for a JSON value, then you can use uh, that uh, concatenation operator. So what there also is, is that uh, I said previously there is uh, the possibility that uh, I can remove data with the minus operator, which you see here. And it's also not changing the result inside the table or inside the stored JSON. It's just uh, on the fly changing some data and viewing the output. So that is the complete JSON as we had before. And I use JSON be pretty here again so that we are able to read it, make it a little bit Bigger here. So that is still the complete value that we have in the JSON. And as you see here, I can change some data and uh, I can work with that, that and there the, the album is still there, the artist ID is there, but the album is completely removed out of that JSON. And that's so far for the comparison, what you can do with relational data and JSON data to turn it upside down, front and back, around as you like. And it's really fast and easy in the end. What I'm doing now is uh, going to create a table to import the data from this Amazon book reviews. <laughs> so first I create that table. That's done. It's only one field inside. That is that uh, JSONB field. The data is stored in, in a file formatted as JSON. So I import that data. That takes some seconds because, well, even in 1998, Amazon had several book reviews. And, uh, well, that's it. Took seven seconds, which is, when we have a look for nearly 600,000 records, that's fast enough, I think, to import it into the database with one query. So I really love copy. So let's see how it does look like. We only take the first record here. And here you see the structure is some sort of reviews, dates, whatever it is, votes, rating, helpful votes, and product stuff inside, grouping. Uh, there are a lot of fields inside that, uh, that JSON. So now we just select some data from that JSON. What I'm doing here is uh, I get the product title and get the average uh, review uh, for the rating for the review. 
and uh, to see what the data is about. And I do it only by one category. So I have uh, also aware inside. And for calculating that data from the JSON fields inside this uh, one table, having this average stuff with 200, nearly 250 milliseconds. It's not that slow, I think. But it's OK for some sort of things, for 600,000 records. But now let's create that gin index. That also takes, obviously, some time to create all the paths. It has to pass all, pass all the JSON values inside uh, that table takes nearly 20 seconds as usual but for 600,000 records but you only do it once and then you have access through the index and now let's see how fast it is now 8 milliseconds so that index was worth creating it I think so you see it takes the index really everywhere When you take a look at the explain plan, you see that uh, he does the index scan right here. So bitmap index scan and it just uses the index and to reduce the data and to aggregate it then afterwards, it's just worth creating an index on this JSON stuff. Let's go a little bit on. Get some more data out of it. So it takes a little bit longer because that's calculation about uh, over the, the old data in the database. So there are lots of uh, reviews with books that don't have a category we see here. And these ones have uh, the most, some of the very Hard amount of reading. So, and here we have the categories, the average rating, and uh, so we can even go over the whole data and uh, query the data, doing whatever we want with this JSON. Um, and these kind of things is the reason why MongoDB announced uh, early this year with their uh, re release in, in February, I think it was. Uh, they announced that they have um, now an BI tool. So out of the box, BI tool with MongoDB. The fun fact is, uh, at that time, it turned out the BI adapter for MongoDB is Postgres. They created a foreign data wrapper where you can access external data. And uh, then you can access your MongoDB data directly from Postgres and do attach every reporting tool that you would like to attach. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating an index on the product category just to show that it is possible. It doesn't help very much because that JSON index uh, usually does that beforehand. So it's not faster than it was before. There was a difference when I did that first with 9.4. Uh, it turned out that the query was faster after I created the index. In 9.5, I tested it a lot of times. And uh, that was really an increase in, in, in what Postgres does in 9.5 in, in, uh, um, in performance. So, well. So that's it. For me, about indexes, JSON, Postgres for today. Any questions? Then, thank you. Uh, yes? Thank you very much for your presentation. Kari uh, Bayan from uh, University of Hatif, Rabat, Morocco. Uh, so, uh, so, with this, uh, so we have uh, Hive and Impala. That can tackle uh, uh, JSON uh, JSON two. We have uh, 
Yes. Can I can I uh, let uh, store the JSON on uh, HDFS, and uh, so have this metaphor of SQL and still use Postgres? You and can. Forget about yes. Uh, um, you can do it. There is even a foreign data wrapper for for Hadoop. I can I talk about uh, external data, which is that I talk about that tomorrow. Um, you can put everything inside there if you need to index it. If you need to access it much often, you can also create. What I used here is I copied the data inside from that file. Uh, what you can also do is you just link them instead of copy them and then create materialized use on top of it. So then you can access the data in a relational way again and still have uh, the other parts as JSON stored away. You only access them when you create then the materialized views. And then you have everything available that you can use for JSONB. All functions, everything. So it gives a lot of opportunities what you can do with JSON data. Any more questions? Thank you very much.